All right, so we're looking at the phenomenology of spirit. We're looking at a very, very tiny portion of it right now, the introduction. And what's an author supposed to do in their introduction usually? You guys read a lot of texts in your classes. Do you always skip the introduction? I know I skip quite a few introductions. Um, why, why do you skip introductions? Yeah. Because it generally just sets everything up to bring you in to what they're going to talk about. Okay. Yeah, it's a setup. Um, if their if their book is understandable by itself, you should probably be able to like figure out what ought to be in the introduction after you've read the book, right? Um, any other reasons you don't read introductions? Yeah. If it's too long. If it's too long, you know, like a hundred page introduction to a forty page book, that's probably uh, imbalanced. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Um, any other reasons? I, I don't read it sometimes because I'm lazy. Um, admittedly, and I have to do a lot of reading, like you do, the students, and so I'm kind of selective in what I'm going to read the introduction to and what I'm not going to. You could read the Phenomenology of Mind, um, or Phenomenology of Spirit, that's how you translate Geist, the German word, um, without reading the introduction, and I think you could get a lot out of it, but Hegel is giving you the sort of keys to his method in part um, in that, that very short introduction. And Hegel's philosophy is a bit different than what you guys have been encountering so far. Um, Hegel is writing at a time when philosophy is particularly ripe in the sense that morning, it's, it's been developing you know, self-consciously for quite a while. Think about the, the very first texts that we started reading were Plato, but you could go even further back before Plato to what we call the pre-Socratics. Philosophy has a long history. Um, philosophers respond to each other. They write about each other. They take each other's ideas into account. Um, by the time that Hegel is writing, it's been going on for over 2,000 years. And there had been some recent challenges. People that we haven't read in this class that Hegel is responding to, like uh, Immanuel Kant, who said, look, the whole history of metaphysics and of morals up until this point has basically been a history of mistakes. I'm going to try to set it on a, a right path once and for all. And usually anytime somebody says that they're going to do that once and for all, <coughs> what actually happens? Does that, does that settle everything? It gets more messed up. Yeah, it, gets, it, gets, it just adds more to the puzzle, you know. And now you've got one more ism, one more type of philosophy, one more person to read. Um, they claim to have you know, solved everything, or at least outlined the whole program. Um, and it turns out that, that that's not really the case. Um, now, Hegel is the kind of guy, and I think some of you are, are in this sort of boat, who wants to know about everything, who wants to figure out how everything fits together. He uses this word that you uh, came across very early on. <coughs> and you're probably like, well, what is that? The absolute. You know? Um, that's a good question. And, and Hegel's not going to actually give you an answer in this little section that we're reading. He's presuming that you have some sort of background knowledge about this. When we're talking about the absolute, we mean something like, you know, uh, the whole, or meaning, or what is, it, what is most meaningful, you know? When, if you're asking questions about what's the meaning of life, you're in a certain sense asking absolute questions. What is everything made of? That's a question <coughs> about the absolute. Um, what am I going to eat for breakfast after class? That's not a question about the absolute. See the big difference between them? What should I do with my life? Hmm, is that a question about the absolute or isn't that a question about the absolute? Could go either way. You know, If you're <coughs> saying, what should I do with my life because I want to make a ton of money and um, money is really important, money makes the world go round, etc., 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 um, we might say, oh, that's, that's you know, just um, talk about, about uh, banal things. No, actually, let's talk about the absolute. 
if you think that money is the be-all and end-all by which everything is measured, money is for you an absolute. Um, and there's something to that. That's, that's a grander way of thinking than just saying, hey, I want to make a buck. Isn't it? Somebody who actually believes that money is the most important thing in the world <coughs> and they try to understand everything in terms of money, that's a real project, isn't it? Um, that's kind of admirable. Somebody who thinks of the meaning of life in terms of style and living the most artistic, rich, full, uh, experientially, um, <coughs> what would you call it, uh, diverse life possible, that would also be a stance about the absolute that's talking about what is, what is greatest, what is best. Um, when you say, you know, what everything consists in, those are statements about the absolute as well. And the goal is to figure out, well, what actually is this thing, the, the absolute? <clears throat> you notice there's a lot of answers to this, right? Some people do think that money is the way to evaluate everything. Other people think that something like um, a religious standpoint would provide you with the keys to understanding everything. And there's a lot of different alternatives out there as far as that goes. Some people think that um, human development and uh, making actual the potential that's within us is, is what's absolute. There's, there's a lot of different candidates for this. So how do we figure this out? Well, we have to have some way of going about this, because otherwise, imagine that each single one of you at, that, at this moment got up and shouted what is most valuable in your life at this point in time. What would the classroom be like? What's that? All over the place. Well, your, your answers would be all over the place. Could any of you actually pay any attention to anybody else's answer while you're shouting at the top of your lungs and everybody else's? <laughs> Probably not. It would be a pandemonium, wouldn't it? Like, it would be like what William James called a booming, buzzing confusion. Um, it would be hard to make sense of. So we want to look at things in a, a somewhat different, more orderly, systematic way. And Hegel's adding a bit more stuff to the mix, too. Hegel is a philosopher who thinks in terms of development, culture, time, and history. So, now just think about this class. This is an introduction to philosophy class. You came in here and some of you had read some of the people that we were going to look at. You know, I remember that poll I did at the very beginning. Who, who's heard anything about Plato? Who's read Plato? Um, Thomas Aquinas was the one that you guys had, had heard of the most and some of you had actually read. Then we, we started reading these guys in order, in a sort of chronological order. We skipped a lot of people, admittedly. But did you see any, any progress moving as we went from like the ancient stuff into the medieval stuff and into the modern stuff? Did you see any progress being made? Or did, did it just seem like just, well, this guy thinks this, and this guy thinks this, and this guy thinks this, and they're all kind of full of it, and yeah. Well, yeah, I felt like some of the, uh Fosters worked off of other fosters. Like they used some of their ideas. Yeah. Like some like fellow people use Cicero's and Aristotle's ideas. Like they correlate to their own. Very good. Yeah, that's that's a sign of progress when you can take somebody else's viewpoint and go beyond it by have you guys ever heard that expression standing on the shoulders of giants? Yeah. Um, now, if you, you know, if you're not a giant and you stand on the shoulder of a giant, you still see further than that giant does, don't you? Right? Even if you're just a tiny little dwarf, um, you would see further than that giant does. And Aristotle is one of those kind of giants. Cicero, you know, Augustine. Um, maybe we're not actually smarter than them on our own individually. But, you know, somebody like Hegel would say, well, you know, we've made some progress beyond them. The very fact that, you know, you can get Aristotle, if you, if you were really into Aristotle, you can buy his works in like, you know, the, the Greek and English on facing pages is about this long of a shelf, and you can get in a book about this thick, you know, that's got that kind of paper that they <coughs> use for Bibles, that very thin paper, you know, so you can pack a lot into it. Um, now, you could, you could do that, or you could pick any other philosopher who you or any other, think about any other thinker who's got something to say about what is most important, what is meaningful in life. It might be a historian, it might be a person in literature, it might be a poet, 
Um, it might be somebody in your field who actually wrote something interesting, theoretical, uh, about you know, what makes people tick. Sooner or later, they're all doing philosophy. As soon as you start getting to a certain level of thought, you're doing philosophy. And there is progress that's being made. And Hegel wants to try to figure out, what does this all mean? The absolute can change over time for Hegel. It can grow. So we're, he would say, in many respects, in a better position than, say, Plato was, or even Augustine was, or um, if you were Hegel today, I suppose you'd say, we're in a better position today than, than Hegel himself was. So this idea of progress or development is important, too. Um, and well, he calls that dialectic. Um, <clears throat> somewhat different use of the term than what Aristotle was meaning by it, but nonetheless, it's, it's being used that way. <coughs> now, you notice I got this big word up here, phenomenology, and then here's Hegel's actual, you know, tagline for this: the science of the experience of consciousness. That's what he's up to in this this work. That's what you know the introduction's about. Um, that's perfectly clear, right? The science of the experience of consciousness. You understand more or less what each of those words mean. Well, that's what phenomenology is. And there you go. Everyone understands perfectly now, right? No, no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, oh, if only it were that simple. Um, let's look at each one of these in, in turn. So you got this big uh, Greek sounding word, phenomenology. Uh, you guys know from long you know, go back in your elementary and middle school days, whenever you got an ology, what does that mean? Science, Science or the study, or yeah, very good. So biology, study of life, bios is life. So you got this big word phenomenon. Um, and when we say phenomenon, we often don't use it in a technical term. We just mean something that is happening or something we want to talk about. Oftentimes we trot it out when we want to sound a little bit erudite. So instead of saying, you know, um, I would like to talk about the traffic that's out there on uh, on uh, nine and how people drive too fast. You know, it's a forty mile. No, it's a thirty here, right? Thirty or forty here? Thirty. So it's a thirty zone here and it's a forty zone back there, and people are driving sixty and fifty. I don't like that. Now, if you want to sound a little bit erudite, you could say, "I would like to talk about the phenomenon of people driving faster than than is warranted by conditions." Just by adding that word phenomenon in there, it sounds a little bit higher level, doesn't it? Um, but all phenomenon actually means is what appears. What we notice, you know? You could just as well say, I've been noticing that people drive awfully fast on that road out there, way over the speed limit, uh, myself included, some of the time. Um, especially if I don't watch it, I've got one of those cars where it can go, you know, pretty fast if I'm not paying attention to it. Um, phenomenology means sort of the study of appearances, the study of what it is that, that we perceive. Um, how do things actually appear to us? And you might say, why would you need a science about that? Aren't you perceiving stuff already? Yeah, I mean, that's a legitimate you know, worry right there. Yeah. But sometimes what we perceive is not how it actually is. Mm. That's one key <coughs> issue. Isn't it? There's a difference between what we call appearance and then reality, right? And we have had cases where um, what something appears to us at first turns out not to be the case. Now, how do you know that it's not the case, though? A new appearance comes up, right? Something else appears to you, something else is perceived by you. Um, you think, for example, that this is coffee, you take a sip, um, it smells like coffee as you're taking a sip, and then it tastes like kerosene. And you say, oh, I don't like that, because um, kerosene tastes pretty bad. Um, shouldn't get in the habit of drinking kerosene. Um, I've known people, by the way, who used to gargle with kerosene when they get sick. Not a good idea. Um, now, 
how do you know that? Well, you're expecting one phenomenon and you experience a different phenomenon. All we have, Hegel would say, is a whole chain of connected appearances appearing to us that we take in. Um, when you find out that a friend is no longer the person that you thought them to be, you know, there is an appearance, right? And sometimes people, human beings, <coughs> deliberately um, project an appearance that's not the reality. Isn't that the case? Um, I'll give you an example from when I was a student myself. Um, I had a hard time staying, staying awake in class when I was a student at times. And there are certain dodges that you can do to try to um, appear like, and you, know, you guys know what it feels like. Your eyelids start drooping, you're having trouble keeping them open. <coughs> um, what else? You know, you have that fuzzy kind of feeling. You lose a sense of time. The words that are being said become disconnected. Um, so what do you do to make sure that the, the professor doesn't think that you're actually falling asleep? Um, well, you kind of shade your eyes a bit like this and go like this, right? But then they can't see that your eyes are closed. Um, definitely don't put your head down on your desk because that gives it away. Um, find something to stare fixedly at, like you're, you're deep in thought. You know, nod every once in a while, like <laughs> you're paying close attention. That's an appearance, right? That's an appearance that you're deliberately projecting. Um, what's the reality in that case? You're just completely gone. Yeah, you're, you're, you're checked out, right? And, and how does the professor know that? Something else might happen, like suddenly your head falls forward. And, and they're like, you're falling asleep, you know? Uh, yeah, what were you going to say? Um, but this door phenomenon, I like to have a connotation of um, something that's not expected. Well, you, you could have phenomena that are not expected, but we, we do expect <coughs> um, most of the stuff in our experience to be about the same. So, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have that connotation. Um, I suppose there could be some discourses in which that's, that's an unexpected phenomenon, where, where, where that's the case. I can't think of any offhand. What, what do you have in mind? No, I'm, you just usually you hear like phenomenon when something like unbelievable. Oh, like somebody's a phenomenon. Yeah. They're a phenomenal player, you know, they're a phenomenal orator. Yeah, that has, the, that you're right, that has a connotation of like being amazed by something and we're being amazed when we're experiencing something unexpected. So I, I think that would make sense. Um, let's, so let's go back to this now. So what appears, what we take notice of, that, that can change over time. We can acquire better understanding of what's out there by having better appearances, more reliable appearances, but really all we have to work on are appearances. Now he's got this thing, the science of the experience of consciousness. So each one of these terms is, is important. <clears throat> Let's work our way back. Consciousness, right? Start with the, the very last thing. Every one of you, for Hegel, is consciousness in, in the sense that he's talking about. You are a conscious human being. Even if you weren't a human being, you would be conscious of your environment. But we human beings are conscious of not only of our environment, but also much more. We have an inner life, don't, too, don't we? You have your own perceptions, your feelings, your memories. You sometimes take positions about that. Think, for example, um, of a case where something that, um, we use an unpleasant memory because those are easier oftentimes to, to recall. <clears throat> Think of a case in high school where you were, you were embarrassed for one reason or, or for another. I'm willing to bet that, that every single one of you, your high, high school set of experiences includes at least one experience where you were embarrassed because <laughs> it's that time of life, right? College probably does too already. Um, now, what's going on when you remember that? Where was that memory before? Sedimented somewhere in you, right? We would often say, well, it was like stored in your brain cells. We have a physical explanation of it. There's other ways to explain it. Um, you're remembering that. Who's that memory about? What's that? Who's it about? It's your memory, right? Who, who's, who, what's the memory? Who's the person this memory is about? It's the memory of you being embarrassed. Yourself in it's right. you remembering yourself, <clears throat> a previous self, 
who is yet at the same time the same <coughs> person as you are. Otherwise, you can't. Do you, do you have any memories like that where it doesn't embarrass you anymore? You're like, yeah, I was really embarrassed at the time, but now I couldn't care less. Maybe there is a, you know, enough of a distance. There's a, the feeling that that's no longer me. Um, if you don't have that, if, if you actually remember it and you feel embarrassed again, then you are being conscious of something in your inner life, of something that no longer exists, of a past that is long gone, but still has presence for you in the present. That's amazing. That's just one thing that you do routinely. Um, <clears throat> when you drop a shopping list, you're probably not thinking, yeah, I'm doing philosophy, you know. No, you're just going and getting, you know, whatever it is that you're going to get, some flour, milk, eggs, you know, Pringles, I don't know, whatever it is that you get. Um, socks, you know, if you're going to Walmart maybe, where you get a whole bunch of things. You are um, orienting yourself towards your environment when you draw up a list. You're making a plan for yourself. We, we take these things for granted, but we don't realize just how much thinking is going on in all this. When you become infatuated with somebody, you're thinking about them all the time. They have become what, what Hegel says, an object for you. And you not only have mental representations of them, you know, you like thinking about them. You know, I saw them at the, at the coffee shop and, you know, um, they smiled at me, and that smile was such a great smile, and you know, all that sort of stuff, right? You also have feelings that come about. Those feelings somehow get infused into the very um, thoughts that you have about the person, the images that you're working with. You have desires, expectations. I wonder if I should call them. Maybe I'll just send a text. What should I text them? That's all consciousness. Um, when you're working in your classes, and you're thinking about, how am I going to write this paper that you know, I just got the assignment sheet for, and I have no interest whatsoever in this subject. Um, and I admittedly have not been listening as well as I have been, so I'm not quite sure, you know, what the teacher is looking for. But they're an awful teacher, too, and I have no idea how to possibly please them and get out of this class that, I, you know, I have two weeks left in. I can admit, that might be the case for some of you, right? Again, that's all consciousness. All these things together. Um, our consciousness. And you notice I've described a whole bunch of activities that are distinctively human. They take us beyond the merely animal. And every one of us is capable of them. Every one of us does these fairly routinely without thinking about them. But if we want to, we could actually pay attention to them. We could actually watch our consciousness taking place. <clears throat> and there's a lot of techniques for doing this. Um, some are associated with philosophy. Some are associated with religion. Some are just associated with, you know, various um, uh, training techniques, things like that. Some are associated actually with writing techniques. But they all involve paying attention to consciousness. So that brings us to this point of experience. Now Hegel has a very particular way of talking about experience um, that he says, this is a little bit different than what you would ordinarily expect um, when we're talking about experience. So I'm going to actually move, you know, very far into um, the, uh, the introduction. He says, um, consciousness, it grasps not only the object that it's thinking about, it also grasps itself. It sees whether there's a, an accord or a discord between the object and itself. Consciousness develops over time. Um, there's, there's all sorts of uh, distinctions that he's making along those, those lines. And then he says, um, when we're thinking about the standards that we bring to, uh, to, to look at these things, the, the science, by, by leaving a lot of the standards that we'd be normally um, bringing aside, by, by sort of just, you know, taking it into ourselves, paying close attention to what's going on, we're enabled to treat and discuss a subject as it actually is in itself and for, it, for itself in its complete reality. So for Hegel, you know, we can get beyond the appearances. We get more appearances, but that's okay. 
Now, how does this have to do with experience? He says this dialectic process, so we get that word dialectic again. What does he mean by that? There's development. There's a process by which you're moving up from one stage to the next. So think, for example, about where you are now as a student. Just think about your skills as a student. What are key skills that you need to have in order to make it as a student in classes? Yeah. Determination. That's more of a, uh, a characteristic. What are some of the like basic operations and skills that you? So like reading, that, reading, writing, mathematics. Okay. So let's just take reading and writing. Leave the math aside because that gets very complicated <laughs> very quickly, and there's a lot of interesting theories about that. A lot of your classes have you doing reading, right? I imagine that most of you are pretty good readers by this point. How many of you started out as great readers? A few of you might have. How many of you had to develop as readers? Okay, how did that happen? You went from a lower stage to a better stage to a better stage. Did that happen just sort of like taking, you know, one piece of machinery out of your brain and putting another piece in? Is that the way human minds work? Did it happen just by you being placed in different contexts and sort of like a fish, you know, in, in different environments, you just sort of figured out, oh, I'm no longer in the river, I better, you know, adjust to the lake. Now, you probably had some struggle, right? Did you have to think about, did you ever <coughs> learn techniques, bless you, um, techniques for reading? What, what do those include, like taking notes, writing questions on the side? What do you guys do to, to read well? I don't, I don't know if they teach you guys these days. Read a lot. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Yeah, the more you read, and the better stuff you read, the better a reader you become. And the better writer, too, by the way. Um, what else? Are there other techniques that they taught you? That at first you were like, oh, God, I hate this crap. I, I can't stand doing this. But then after a while, you're like, oh, this actually pays off for me. And then after a while, it's part of your nature. And then, it, you know, you can actually get to the point where you, you have trouble turning it off. That's dialectical development. You contain the old where you used to be, but now you've moved to a higher stage. You can still do things at the lower level. You can still read just for pleasure, right? I hope. You, all, learning all these techniques of studying and reading has not turned it off so that you can't pick up a book that you don't have to read for class and actually enjoy what you're reading. If that happens, something's gone wrong. <laughs> Some, somebody screwed, screwed up along the way. <laughs> but you've managed to go to higher and higher stages. You've encapsulated it within itself. So he says, this dialectical process which consciousness executes on itself, on its knowledge as well as on its object, in the sense that out of, the new, out of it the new and true object arises, is precisely what is termed experience. So then he talks in very, what we would call metaphorical, but he's actually being quite technical terms. A little bit later he says, um, the new object, the new thing that you're thinking about. Now, the object doesn't necessarily have to mean an object like this. The object could be your own processes of understanding. It could be the history of something. That could be the object. Whatever it is that you're thinking about. The new object contains the nothingness of the first. The new object is the experience containing that first object. So uh, that's a weird way of talking. Contains the nothingness of the first. You know, like you have a box of nothing. I mean, that's easy to get, right? Just get yourself a box. It's already got nothing in it. He doesn't mean nothingness in that sense. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. So he says, um, in the treatment of this course of experience, there's an element in virtue of which it does not seem to be in agreement with what is ordinarily understood by experience. Well, we ordinarily think of experience as just kind of wandering around, feel this, feel that. Oh, there's a set of keys. Oh, there you got colors. Put them in my pocket. Nothing is connected. Right? Nothing is, is uh, a systematic, conjoined whole that makes sense. Just a bunch of things all strung together. Does your life sometimes feel like that? Particularly when you're tired or stressed out? Um, you're having a lower level of experience than, than what Hegel's talking about. So, he says, on the view above given, the new object is, is seen to have come about by a transformation or a conversion of consciousness itself. This way of looking at the matters are doing, what we contribute. When, for example, 
you decided to come to college. And, and at first it might have been because, you know, you, you are expected to go to college, right? I think most of you at least come from households where that is the basic expectation. If you're not doing college, they want to know what the hell are you planning to do, right? And so it, it's kind of a path that, that's more or less set out for you. Um, there's also other, you know, impetuses. The guidance counselors probably told you if you don't go to college, you're going to, you know, have a dead-end job and an unsatisfactory life because, you know, they showed you the statistics. College graduates tend to earn more than, than high school graduates, <clears throat> all that sort of stuff. That may have gotten things going, but are you at the point now where you have sort of thought it through and realized, yeah, this is where I belong. I actually do want to be in college. This, this makes sense for me. This is something that I can get behind as an autonomous person, not just as somebody who's being driven by outside forces. Again, that's, that's consciousness. And that is you making a decision about yourself, which is you engaging in what Hegel is calling experience. And if you can tell yourself something like, you know, I used to think that going to college was just what I had to do because mom and dad wanted me to do that, or, you know, I, I used to think that it was the, the smart thing to do just because I need to get a good job because the economy is tough and I don't want to live in a studio apartment my entire life um, eating ramen, um, you know, pick a picture of whatever else you want in that sort of life, never going on vacation, those sorts of things. Um, you still retain that. That's still part of who you, you were and what you were thinking. And now you say, but my thinking has progressed beyond that. I now realize that there's something worthwhile here for me, something intrinsically valuable that I want to learn or I want to do. It, it could even be like, you know, I, I found a circle of friends that I actually enjoy being with. It doesn't necessarily have to be something academic. Um, but there's something that you're able to say, I'm at a higher level now. That's what Hegel is calling experience. The higher level does not completely get rid of the lower level. This is what, when he's talking about the nothingness, from the perspective of the lower level, the higher level is nothing. But it turns out not to be nothing. It turns out to be everything. It turns out to be what puts everything else into perspective. Your life is going to be a whole series of experiences like that, which is great. That's part of what makes life so interesting. And we can share these with each other too, by the way. It's not just a matter of our own individual experiences like that. We can have group experiences like that. We can experience that as a culture. We, this, is how, this is how civilizations improve and also how they, they can decline. So um, he talks about the experience that consciousness has concerning itself. And he says, now, if we're serious about this, that has to embrace everything. This is where you might depart from Hegel. This is where you might say, yeah, you know, I followed you so far. I kind of like the stuff that you're saying. Experience, okay, now i got a better understanding of it. It means having, like, these stages where, you know, the, the higher stage contains the lower stage and yet surpasses it. That sounds great. But... Um, do I really have to embrace nothing less than the entire system of consciousness, the whole realm of the truth of mind, and in such way that the moments of truth are set forth in their specific and peculiar character that they here possess? Anybody uh, have that as their project now? Not yet? I mean, if you did, you'd be Hegel. Right? <laughs> That's why Hegel wrote this book, The Phenomenology. He was trying to make sense out of everything. He was trying to say, yeah. So we. He says that conscious, conscious. I can't talk. Go ahead. He's trying to build upon itself as you go throughout life, and it retains all of the previous moments, but you are beyond that, and you go to a higher level. Yeah. And yet he says that you must now. What was it? Accept the completeness of consciousness? He says embrace nothing less than the entire system of consciousness. So what that would mean is actually trying to understand not just your consciousness and your own development, but all the important moments of development that have taken place through the history of mind, civilization, culture, up to the point where you exist. Because you're actually a product of that. 
So that would mean sort of a, a, you know, this vast retrospective, trying to figure out how did we end up here. That's a big project. It's, so he's not dipping into like history? Not just dipping into it. Um, for Hegel, philosophy is what is going to unite all of the other disciplines that study human beings. History, economics, political theory, psychology, all of those have their, their place within this giant, vast Hegelian system. Again, <clears throat> this is one of those places where you know you might get on the Hegel train this far and then say, ah, this is the station where I go up, right? Um, the, the notion that we have to have a full systematic understanding of everything. Hegel thought he supplied that in this, this book, The Phenomenology of Spirit, which is about this thick, so, you know, a lot of stuff going on there. He also seemed to think that history ended in 1807, which is when he published The Phenomenology of Spirit, um, that all the essential changes, transformations, shapes of consciousness had all more or less been developed by that point. Um, that would be another place where you would probably say, oh, well, Hegel, you know, you, you got some things perhaps right, but that, that one you're probably wrong about, you know. Did history, history in the sense of meaningful history, where something radically new comes on the scene. Um, did that really end in 1807 with Napoleon, you, you know, and the Battle of Jena, um, who is supposed to be, you know, be like fighting at the very time that he's finishing the proofs for the phenomenology, which may not be true. Um, probably not. Right? I mean, we think that history is still ongoing. Human beings are still developing in important ways. Um, but you, you wouldn't have to necessarily abandon everything that Hegel's saying in order to, to, to note that point. Um, let's, I was going to actually like try to walk through these, these sort of guiding questions. But let's actually look at um, just a few of the things that are going on in this introduction. I, I can see that we're not going to actually get through all of the introduction, which is kind of funny, um, since, you know, it's a short piece, and uh, it is, in fact, supposed to be just an introduction, so it should be easy to get through, but, but I think I've taken too much time with examples. Um, let's look at where he's actually starting in this, this, this introduction now. So, if we want to lay out a schematic, we want uh, knowledge. And we're trying to study the conditions of knowledge. How it is that we actually come to know things. And what do we end up knowing? These aren't the terms that he's using here. Um, he's using consciousness. Uh, did I leave out an S? No, I think that's right. Um, and what we call the object. And in this case, it's hopefully the absolute. Or it could be any other object of knowledge. And knowledge is some sort of relationship between the subject and the object. He starts out by talking about two ways that we often conceive of knowledge. Knowledge is some sort of instrument. Or knowledge is some sort of um, medium. Um, what do we mean by an instrument? Well, you know, think about instruments that you use to acquire knowledge. How do you, in fact, experience the world that you want to know about? Some things you don't really need an instrument, right? You've got the instruments inside of you. Uh, is there a person in front of the room talking right now, if you were to doubt that? Um, let's say you actually thought, nah, maybe he's a hologram. He phoned it in today. Is there a way you could test that? Look for the jacket. Look for projectors. There's a simpler way. Get up, walk up to me, and like poke me. And say, oh, I guess he's solid, you know. And then, well, maybe you know, Doctor Sadler actually used his um, his robot, you know, Doctor Sadler, and sent him in to teach the class with some pre-recorded lecture. Um, well, then you like open up my head or something like that, right? They're instruments by which you can acquire knowledge about things. Um, <clears throat> these are kind of silly examples, but think of other instruments. Um, how do you know what to wear for, for going outside on any given day? Look outside. <laughs> yeah. If it's sunny, well, maybe a hat. 
Um, what else, though? Let's, get, let's say we get beyond that. Um, check the weather. Yeah, okay. You check the weather. And what is that? We, we, that that's one of those things that we take for granted. It's part of our natural attitude. It's part of our culture. Well, I just check the weather. I mean, that's something that we have available to us that, that people, you know, long ago didn't. They would have to just, like, look outside and kind of hope for the best. Um, but we can check the weather. It's going to rain later today with a 50% chance. Now, how do they know that? I mean, you might say, well, they actually don't know that. They're off and wrong. But yeah, let's say they actually do know that. How do they know that? Yeah. So it's yeah, uh, weather patterns or systems. Okay, so that's, that's really good. There's an entire system of instruments that they use and they correlate together um, that get them to be almost 50% accurate a lot of the time. Um, which is pretty good for, for meteorology, given how complex the weather actually is. Um, in the old days, you just had the farmer's almanac, and you'd consult that, and that was almost as good as nothing, really, um, except for growing seasons. Now, here's the interesting thing to think about. Does an instrument, when you apply it to know something, do instruments leave the thing that you're trying to know intact, or do they sometimes modify it? Think about, for example, a microscope. You guys all remember putzing around with microscopes in, in biology in high school? What did you have to do in order to get something on that microscope? Focus it. You had to focus it, okay. That's, that's operating the machinery itself. Could you look at anything? Could you like say, I want to look at this pen real close up? You stick it under there. Why couldn't you just stick that under there? Air ah, very good. You have to be prepared a certain way. Instruments require that what it is that they're looking at be modified to fit that instrument. And oftentimes we don't realize this, that we're contributing something to the thing that we're trying to know and sometimes modifying it in the process. So what is our knowledge actually of? Is our knowledge actually of the thing itself? Or is our knowledge, in some respects, an artifact that we create by the application of our instrument? Yes? Couldn't you say that our knowledge is just based off of, like, fundamentalism? Like, we take that small piece of something, yeah. modify it so we observe it, and then take anything that we got, uh, learn from that slice and apply it to the whole? Yeah, I mean, we do that, in fact. Um, the question is whether that's actually knowledge or whether that's just sort of supposition on the basis that the part and the whole must resemble each other quite a bit. And, um, you know, we're also still modifying that part, aren't we? Now, you know, another possibility would be knowledge is more like a medium. What does he mean by a medium? Think of the air in this, this classroom. Is the air in this classroom interfering with you seeing me or hearing me? The sound waves? are being transmitted to your, your ears? Is the, is the sound muffled because of the air? Or is it being modified in, in any way? Or are you getting a, a clear signal? It's a very marginal degree. Yeah, a marginal degree, yeah. Um, and, and you can see me just fine, right? Because we have light and we're not smoking in here. You know, two, two generations ago, students, you could actually smoke while you were teaching. Um, when I was in, in, in uh, undergrad, we would light up right after class ended in, in the classroom. It sounds crazy. There were professors, when not when I was a student, but two generations ago, who would lecture and they'd be smoking the whole time. And people would be sitting back there smoking. Now imagine the haze in a classroom with like five or six people smoking. It'd be harder to see, right? Some media end up deforming the uh, signal that you're getting. Think about our media. Imagine um, social media, like Facebook. Um, are you ever getting a really true impression of things through the information that you're getting on Facebook? Let's think about profile pictures for a minute. Um, do profile pictures truly represent the people who they, they are profile pictures of? And just in a visual way. I mean, you can, you can look at them and you can be like, yeah, that's so-and-so. That's, that's a really good picture of them. They, they're, they're quite attractive. 
Do people put up ugly profile pictures most of the time? Yeah, what were you going to say? No. no. <laughs> people will be like, well, here's my good side. And uh, all right, let's get the lighting just right. And then they'll, mo then they'll modify it even more by using some instruments, right? Like Instagram or Picasa or whatever you like. Some people actually Photoshop their pictures, you know? Um, take out, you know, the wrinkles or the blemishes or stuff like that. So the, you, you have to be a little bit suspicious of some media in their ability to just, you know, communicate the reality to us directly. And Hegel says, you know, knowledge uh, in general, uh, we can understand it with either of these, these, these models, and we can start worrying about this. We can start being concerned with what he calls this fear of falling into error. Um, how do we know that we're actually getting the straight, you know, straight information? That we're actually getting true knowledge about the things that we're trying to study? Not only about things out there, but sometimes even about ourselves. You know, we have to understand ourselves through instruments and the media as well. So he says um, this fear of, of falling into error introduces an element of distrust into science with which without any scruples of that sort goes to work and actually does know. It's not easy to understand why and so we should place a distrust in this very distrust um, and we should think about what this fear presupposes something as truth. He says it starts with ideas of knowledge as an instrument and as a medium, presupposes a distinction of ourselves from this knowledge. More, most, more especially, it takes for granted that the absolute stands on one side and knowledge <coughs> on the other side, cut off from the absolute. Hegel's saying all of these things together are actually tied up together. That the absolute, or what it is that we want to know, is not something completely separate from ourselves. Knowledge is not something completely separate from ourselves. I know it's often presented to us that way in textbooks. And just, here's the textbook. The textbook has information. That's knowledge. It's your job to fill your empty heads you know, with that knowledge. But what's going on is actually much more organic, much more synthetic than just simply you filling your head with a bunch of data. That works for computers. But your mind is not a computer in that sense. Your mind is consciousness. And your mind is already, by virtue of thinking about these sort of things, extending itself through all of this. Um, that's why objects can be phenomena for you. That's why they can appear to you, because they're already within your consciousness to a certain extent. Um, Let me skip ahead a little bit. So he's, he's worried about um, not falling into two different things. Two ways of looking at things that can get us into trouble. One of these is what he calls the natural consciousness. And what is wrong with that? It simply takes things or granted, doesn't connect things, or examine or analyze things that, that are in consciousness, right? And what, what does he mean by this? Our, our ordinary way of going about things, not seeing any sort of mystery to, to the world and to our own processes of thinking about the world. Just sort of taking everything as if it's just the way it is, and that's that's just the you know how it how it ended up. Um, when in reality, the way things are is actually a product of very complex historical forces that have been going on for a long time, that often have deep assumptions built into them. Um, our our first ways of responding to things are not just something that comes to us from instinct or nature. It's something that comes to us from where we are in, in history and in culture. You know, think about the idea of fairness. Um, how many of you like things to be fair? Okay. Now, some people take that as a basic human, you know, reaction to things. If we look at history, is that so basic? Does it always have the same sort of force in structuring social relations? as it does in our 
modern, what we call liberal democratic society. And I don't mean liberal in the you know, political sense of like, you know, associated with, with, with the Democratic Party or progressivism. I mean in the sense of like being for rule of law, each person counting for, for one vote, all those sorts of things that we take for granted as part of our culture. Is that even the case everywhere in the world? Is that even the case everywhere in our culture? How many of you have been told at one time or another when you protest about something, life is not fair, better get used to it. There's a contradiction there, isn't there? With, even within our own culture, where fairness is held up as this absolute great value, and yet even within our own culture, there are all these pockets where we're told life is not fair, don't expect fairness. That's what Hegel calls a productive contradiction. And we could go, you know, try to build something out of that. The natural, consci natural uh, consciousness of things would just say, well, you know, you got your fairness over here and your non-fairness over here, and, and okay, that's it. No worries. But if you're, you know, if you're doing things philosophically, you say, well, that does worry me a bit. It's the same culture, right? It's the same basic domain for moral discussion. Shouldn't there be some sort of consistency? If mom and dad are right about life is not fair and I shouldn't expect fairness, then you know, when my political science teacher starts talking about basic you know, fairness as structuring society, what's going on? One of those two better be right and the other one wrong, or else maybe both of them are wrong. Is there some way in which both of them can possibly be, be right? Besides just saying, well, you know, you got your mom and dad over here, and they handle things there, and then you got your, you know, your academic over here, and the two of them never meet. Well, they do meet, because they're meeting where? In you. You're experiencing dissonance. You're experiencing things not matching. Important things. And you have to figure out how am I going to negotiate this conflict between them. You can't just fall back into things and say, well, you know, I'll just take, take something for granted. Now, the opposite to this, the natural consciousness, would be what Hegel is calling skepticism. And skepticism says, eh, we can't really know anything. Not only shouldn't we take anything for granted, um, once we do stop taking things for granted, everything falls apart. You know? And you, you've known people like this, right? Where they were very firm believers in one way of seeing things, and when that worldview gets shaken, like they go off the, the reservation totally and go crazy, and they're like, nothing matters to me anymore. I can't trust anything. And you find them you know, uh, involved with something equally, you know, uh, irrational later on because they had to throw themselves into something. Before they get to that, they're a skeptic. And the skepticism is corrosive. And skepticism is a stance that people can take. Um, it is a distinct human possibility for consciousness. It's a way for consciousness, Hegel thinks, to assert its own freedom as opposed to the object. It can say no to everything. It can say, I don't believe you to everything. But is it, is it productive? Will it, get you, will it get you anywhere? What do you think? No, why not? Yeah, there you go. When you, when you say no to everything, because everything could possibly be wrong or misleading or deceptive, you, you actually do close, your off, close yourself off to things. And you are taking a stance without seeming to take a stance, right? And you won't be able to progress. And Hegel is all about consciousness progressing. Um, you know, there may be different times for, for tackling different, different topics. You know, one example of this is I have students who take, you know, the ethics class when they're supposed to, you know, when you're a junior. And it's just not a good time for them. And then they come and they take a senior year and they're like, yeah, now this finally makes sense to me. I can wrap my head around this. Um, but imagine saying, I'm never going to study any of this stuff because it, it could all possibly be deceptive. You would never make any progress. Imagine doing that with love. Never going to love anybody because anybody could be a deceiver. 
never going to have any, any romantic relationships because, you know, not, not, not actually they're all going to be bad. They all could be bad. What would that life be like towards about 80 years old? Full of regrets, I imagine, right? And, and uh, would, would a life like that even be able to generate a full understanding of how it went wrong? Probably not. It's only those who've progressed who can have a full understanding of where things go wrong. So, um, he talks about natural consciousness um, as something we want to avoid. We also want to avoid skepticism. Um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about is how, how do we actually make progress with this? So how do we get away from this? Hegel seems to think that consciousness historically, long before you or me came on the scene, went through You know, I'm actually going to not say consciousness, I'm just going to put C so I can do a better diagram. Consciousness comes through making higher and higher stages. It's much more complex than, than this, right? Otherwise you wouldn't write a big thick book to explain it. And it happens by there being conflicts between different consciousnesses, representing different points of view. Somehow, the higher stage will incorporate what is right in those higher points of view, and it will also be a product and part of reacting against what's wrong in those points of view. So, you know, this will take place not only in human perception, um, it'll take place in law, it'll take place in political systems, it will take place, Hegel thinks, even in the development of religions. Um, it'll happen through art. It'll happen through everything that's important to human beings, through economic organization, all these different things. There'll be some sort of conflict of perspectives, and consciousness, in the broad sense, including all of us, will have to find some way around that, and it will reach a higher stage. Will that higher stage be a finished point? No, there will be another higher consciousness that it will come into conflict with, and then it will have to somehow supersede that conflict and go further and further and further. So this is a quite complex, systematic development, developmental process. If you want to understand where we currently are, you don't just want to you know, accept things for granted, then you want your consciousness to try to encompass all of these stages of consciousness. Um, now, mentally, right? When it, we're going to look at the master-slave dialectic next, next class. I'm not suggesting anybody get themselves a, a dungeon basement and like try to enslave somebody so that they can experience it. And, you know, that's not what Hegel's saying. He's saying you, you, you can think this out. You can actually wrap your head around the development of this. And if you think about any of your professions that you're going into. Um, to truly develop understanding in your profession is not just to know where it is currently, but also how it got there. Not just so that, you know, those who are doomed to, his, doomed to uh, those who don't study history are doomed to repeat its mistakes, not just for that reason, but because that's what it means to actually have full understanding of things. So, you know, for example, fashion, right? Fashion is changing all the time. There are certain constants, though, aren't there? Certain things that you can teach as principles that you're getting in your classes, I hope, right? They're not just saying, all right, everybody, activity time. There's some basic principles. And how did those develop? Those develop through somebody saying, I think it's this way, another person saying, no, I think it's this way. Well, let's see if we can develop a more encompassing systematic view. Now, is that the final stage? No, not yet. Let's keep going with it. What about education? Do you think, you know, we're finished figuring out what's going on in education? Those of you that are considering ed majors? Ed, ed theory changes every five years. It's kind of faddish, actually. Um, doesn't have a lot of uh, understanding of its own history, too, by the way. I wish it did, because I love, I love talking with educators who actually know the history of their discipline. Um, even historians need to know the history of their discipline. That's called historiography. And 
how do you make sense of this? You could think of this also in terms of more personal things. Your family history. Does your family history mean something to you? Do you start out just by saying, well, mom and dad, they're just mom and dad, you know, they're just that way. How do they get to be that way? They developed just like you're developing now. Not exactly the same way. Maybe you guys are advances beyond your mom and dad. Hopefully you are, right? Uh, hopefully each generation gets better and better. That would be what Hegel is calling, this is, this is the process of the dialectic. So, that's an awful lot to take in, I think. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll leave off here. Do you, you feel somewhat uh, better grounded in what's going on in this, this piece? Of, anything make sense? Any, any pieces come together for you? Yeah? Then it did some good.